Back to week four extended, as it were. Uh, terribly sorry about last Thursday, but uh, let's pick up where we left off. Uh, so remember, uh, you guys were all assigned peer reviews uh, for your submitted uh, final version of your logo, since we didn't get a chance to talk about it in person and give each other feedback and do some critiquing. Um, certainly go in and uh, give some feedback to the classmates you were assigned to. Everybody was assigned three classmates. Uh, so go in and check and see, and uh, you'll see who you were assigned to. Just go into the into assignments, go into where you would turn in your final logo, Project 1 Final, uh, and you'll see who you were assigned to under Peer Reviews. Uh, in the meantime, uh, after we finished uh, reviewing the final work, uh, we were going to dive into Project 2 and go over some information about that. So that's what we're going to do right here. Uh, so let's take a look at that. So Project 2 click on this here we'll take you over to this project here so for our second project we are going to do an infographic design uh, infographics of course are uh, visual representations of either real-world objects or made-up objects or combination of both that are meant to uh, present data in an easy to digest fashion it's part of the larger study of data visualization which we'll take a look at in a second um, and so we are going to be doing something with that. Now, of course, you can read through the assignment here in Canvas, which maybe you've already done, or you can download the handout here, which is this PDF here. So I'm going to breeze through it here quickly. Obviously, you can read through it yourself. But I just want to breeze through it just to see if I have any uh, points I want to make uh, that we don't want to forget about. So, of course, our objective here is to design an informative and visually appealing infographic uh, on a chosen topic uh, using Adobe Illustrator. So the topic is entirely up to you. You get to pick which topic you would like the, to do this on. Um, and we'll get to where you can get that from and I have a few examples in a minute, but just know that that part of it is entirely up to you. Uh, so you are going to explore some principles in effective infographic design, including data visualization, hierarchy, and storytelling, which we'll look at a little bit in a minute. We'll talk more about on Tuesday. Uh, you guys are going to select a topic of interest, again, entirely up to you. Could be environmental issues, historical events, social trends, politics, sports, uh, pretty much anything where data is collected and presented uh, and that you find interesting. Now, as far as you know, where to find this data that you will turn into an infographic, uh, you know, you're going to do some research and gather relevant data and information related to your chosen topic. But of course, uh, any major uh, news outlet uh, often will post uh, data-based articles and information. They obviously post their own data visualizations, like the New York Times uh, is a good example, or anywhere on NPR, or pretty much any decent news source. Of course, Sports Illustrated does a ton of these. Um, you can also uh, simply do a web search, just Google uh, anything sort of fun facts about such and such a thing. Fun facts about, you know, beekeeping if you're interested in such things. Uh, and you'll find all sorts of statistics and little tidbits of information. We're not doing a broad, in-depth data visualization. We are simply making a, a vector graphic infographic. Uh, in Illustrator. So it doesn't have to be a ton of data or information, just something small. And we'll look at some examples in a second. Uh, obviously, we're going to be using Adobe Illustrator. You're going to create a visually engaging infographic layout, uh, incorporating text. So yes, we do get to use typography in this assignment. And since we just went over the type tools in Illustrator and a little bit about typography in general, uh, last Tuesday, uh, you now have some tools to use in your typographic portion of this. You can use icons, you can use illustrations, charts, graphs, pretty much anything you want to create that will work in that area. I uh, focus on organizing and presenting your information in a clear and concise manner, and of course, use it, utilizing appropriate color schemes and visual hierarchy. We'll talk about what that means in a minute, um, but we are doing this in full color this time, so no more black and white because uh, soon, next week, we're going to be also diving into the color-based tools in Illustrator, which obviously you've played around with a little bit already. Um, and so we'll be able to incorporate some color in this as well. The final deliverable, of course, is an Adobe Illustrator file. We are also going to learn how to output to a high-resolution PDF, which we'll cover in class uh, a little later on, on Tuesday. Uh, and of course, we will include our short written explanation of your design choices, just like we did in the first assignment. So here's some examples of the types of like data topics or headlines that you could uh, create a, a infographic for, right? 
Uh, you can read these here, these bullet points. So you can see that they're sort of short and sweet, um, real basic bits of database information. Um, so nothing too complex, but something that you find fun or interesting and that you're going to, you know, uh, have fun working on for, uh, for a little bit of time. Uh, specifications, we're going to continue to work uh, 12 by 12. We are working in full color. And these are your general submission guidelines that we normally use. Okay, so while you're chewing on that, let's take a look at what we're talking about. So this is one of my favorite handouts about data. Um, so I should probably tell you too that uh, elsewhere I teach a data visualization class. So full 16 weeks on the history of data visualization as well as uh, data visualization tools such as Infogram and you know all sorts of in-depth uh, data visualization projects. So this is just a little tidbit of that, but this is a handout that I show my students in that, in that class sort of the first week. Uh, boldly declaring, of course, that data isn't boring, and it's not. I love data. Um, the problem with data is that presented in its raw format, um, most people, uh, particularly given certain topics, uh, are not going to make the time to read it and understand it. Um, and it's not so much that they are, you know, unable to uh, or or incapable of it. Uh, they just simply don't have the time, uh, don't have the focus, and have other things to be doing. Um, and furthermore, oftentimes we are talking about topics such as, you know, defense spending or, you know, uh, revenue of the federal government or, you know, uh, sports statistics um, that some people would really relish in diving into in great amounts of detail, but most people just want to get the high points. Um, also, uh, data visualization, uh, showing data in a way that is visually interesting, that tells a story that is narrative-based and uses a lot of good design thinking behind it in terms of choice of color, use of font, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is a good way to get people interested in topics that maybe they're not necessarily. Uh, it can be persuasive, uh, much in the way a documentary can be persuasive. We'll talk a little more about that. So anyway, uh, this handout, aside from uh, having some good information about why data is not boring, shows a bunch of examples of infographics at work. So these are good examples of the types of things you're going to be creating in Illustrator. And maybe not necessarily this entire spread. So this opening one here uh, is about, you know, the idea of data is electric. And then, of course, there is a data visualization going over the... Uh, five points as to why data is electric. But within this, of course, you can see there's a, a variety of visual elements that are being used to represent that. So, of course, we've got your typographic elements, which spell out, you know, bits of written information uh, that are not particularly lengthy. They're easy to digest. They're little nuggets of information that are easy to read. Uh, notice how they're organized, right? People love numbering. People love bulleting. People like little chunks of modular uh, information, smaller than a paragraph, right? Uh, f f even fragmented sentences will get the job done. Um, notice the use of color, right? It's uh, usually high contrast color. Um, it should be thematically appropriate, the colors, right? Whatever it is you're talking about, the color should feel appropriate uh, based on sort of your expectations uh, as a member of society and just sort of general societal expectations, right? Um, and also, the main thing is look at some of the uh, images that are used, these, these specific types of icons or pictograms uh, or pictographs that are being used. Um, they are often flat and simple. They are often uh, sort of archetype images of something, like versions of things that are highly recognizable uh, or, or that can be timely, right? Um, so you can see like we have this icon of the horse or the uh, old-fashioned car here. But then we have a more modern sort of energy saving light bulb going on down here, as well as a smartphone, uh, energy efficient modern refrigerator, you know, has the freezer on the bottom. You can tell just by the way the rectangle is placed above the larger rectangle at the top. Uh, more energy efficient uh, washing machine. This is obviously a front loading washing machine. So again, like we did with our logo design, simple geometric shapes. Uh, thoughtful construction of shapes into recognizable elements, right? Um, in ways that are sort of universal and that are easily understood quickly. Um, so take a look through this. 
So again, these are good examples of the types of sort of infographics you're going to create. Now, like I said, you don't have to do something as extensive as this. Uh, even if you did something like just like number two here, right? Charging an iPhone 6 costs around iPhone 6. This was obviously made a little while ago because um, Apple comes out with a new iPhone every 10 seconds. Um, charging an iPhone 6 costs about 47 cents a year in energy, just to show how energy efficient it is. But this whole number two section that just includes that bit of information about the iPhone and, of course, the modern light bulb and the refrigerator and the washer we were just looking at, like that right there is enough, right, for what we're doing here. Um, you can get as elaborate as you would like beyond that, but that's roughly what we're looking for, is something that contains a little bit of text, a uh, couple of graphics, and that tells a good, solid narrative data story, right? That people can read through the information and they can understand something pretty easily. Uh, okay, let's scroll through some more of these, right? This talks about how data is heartwarming. Notice how the color palette has changed, uh, because now we're talking about something, uh, a different type of... Uh, adverb here, right? It is heartwarming. Um, color palette has changed. The, the overall personality and style of the graphics have changed. They're more rounded. They're more friendly looking, right? Uh, so you can see how these are broken down. Even the way in which the bits of information are organized is different. Yeah, they're still numbered, right? We've still got, you know, five points about how data is heartwarming. Um, just like we had five points about how data is electric. Um, but they're presented completely differently. Uh, they use different geometric shapes, different structures, uh, different presentation in general. And then just to sort of drive home the point about how, you know, choosing color palettes that are thematically appropriate, here we have data is scary, right? Uh, data visualization infographics can be used to convey, you know, not comfortable information or scary information or troubling information that is important for people to know, right? Uh, the FBI estimates that uh, there are between 35 and 50, 50 active serial killers in the United States at any time. I mean, that's something I didn't need to know before I go to bed. Um, but it's important information. Um, and you can see how it's all put together here. And yes, we're still using, you know, simplistic, geometrically based, cartoonish, almost uh, graphics to get the point across. Uh, you know, universally recognizable symbols. We all know who this person is. Um, but the color palette has changed as well to help convey the seriousness of the tone, right? Um, now, you can also apply that logic to font choice, right? You can, you can steer into the baked-in personality of certain fonts. Um, however, this infographic, uh, this larger infographic we're looking at here, has opted to instead stick with pretty much uh, similar modern-looking sans-serif fonts throughout. So that is sort of the common denominator through most of this. Um, and so it's relying instead on style of graphic uh, and color palette to convey the tone from section to section. Um, and that's entirely appropriate too, because on a, on a continuous infographic like this, you don't want to be swapping around fonts too much. Um, but in a more limited fashion, you can pick fonts where the personality of the font also helps convey the particular message you're going for, right? And you can see the types of graphics that have been created here. And, you know, it's a combination of simple geometric shapes. We've got circles, right? We've got uh, uh, various rectangles and triangles and bars and whatnot. But, you know, also recognizable symbols such as the skull and crossbones here. Uh, also, these one color, uh, almost sort of wood stamp graphics uh, down here are really great too, right? Uh, we've got the, uh, you know, you get the syringe, you've got the military tank, you've got the big robot. Uh, you, you've got the, the nanotechnology symbol. So you can see how this goes through. And now we're into a new section, right? Data is reformative. And it talks about that uh, using things like donut graphs as well as um, geographic maps and symbols. You know, some people are surprised to think that maps are data visualizations, but they are, right? They're, they're a visual representation of something that is measurable. So anyway, as we scroll through this rather quickly, and you can find this uh, in our files under week four, if you want to read through all of the details that are here. 
you know, uh, data is hopeful. You can see the tone shifts dramatically, right? We now have completely different color palettes, a much looser, less structured layout of the facts that are being presented. Uh, they're really only delineated by color. Uh, they're, they're not even numbered anymore at this point. Um, and you can see the tone of the graphics that are used, right? Now, based on everything we've learned in Illustrator so far, and you're practicing with it, you know, all of these sort of style of flat, simple graphics that are being presented here, uh, you can make these. You guys are all capable of making these at this point. So really what we're kind of doing here is really um, using our current Illustrator skills to do a little bit of data storytelling. This one here, data is powerful. Uh, they did add a bit of a texture to this. Um, I'm going to show you some resources, probably next class, where you can find things like this, where we're going to be able to add to our, our sort of creation and drawing ability in Illustrator with some pre-made uh, artifacts that we can use. We'll talk about those later on. So anyway, that is just a good example of what we're creating. Again, you're not expected to create something this extensive, but just like a section of something like this would be great. So hopefully by now you're thinking about the type of subject matter you are interested in and that you would want to pursue. Uh, let's look at some more information. Now, of course, uh, infographics are a subsection, a smaller piece of data visualization. Um, and clearly we're not getting into the entirety of what data visualization is, um, but here's just some information that you might find interesting, right? Um, my, my, my favorite short quote of what data visualization is, is just the visual representation of quantitative data. Um, and I would add to that, and, and that is a paraphrase of a quote by Edward Tufte, who is considered sort of the living father of data visualization. Um, but I would add to that, it's the, it's the visual representation of quantitative data uh, in an effort to uh, persuade an audience. Um, and I think the persuade part is important. Um, because if you think about the graphics we just looked at, there were visual choices made, uh, starting with color uh, and the type of uh, images that are created, uh, as well as the way the sections are laid out. And again, like I said, you could also choose fonts to convey a particular message. Um, they're all meant to be persuasive. And, and the best example I can give, which I mentioned briefly earlier, is the idea that it is like a documentary, right? Um, uh, good documentarians, of course, are creating something from factual information. Um, and so oftentimes people misinterpret documentaries as being um, entirely uh, unbiased. And, and that is not true. Um, the information they're working from is factual. And maybe the, the, the data, the facts that they're working from unto themselves are unbiased. Um, that's entirely possible. But the minute that a uh, documentary writer or filmmaker, uh, the cinematographer, anybody involved in it, makes a decision, uh, chooses a type of camera, uh, picks a, a camera angle, edits it a certain way, chooses uh, certain types of music that will appear in the documentary, uh, lights the scene a particular way, uh, chooses the order in which they will interview people for the documentary, uh, or the, the style in which uh, it is shot overall, um, whether it's a feature-length documentary or a multi-part television series, all of those choices uh, are, are ultimately creative choices that are designed to persuade the audience to think one way or another. Um, and all of those things, if we just, if, if it was all presented as blandly and factually as possible, but just some music was chosen to play in the background while people were talking or they were showing information, uh, that alone, that choice alone, would, would persuade an audience uh, a little bit. And so data visualization is the same way in that uh, the, the, the techniques that are used to visually communicate data uh, or information by, by turning it into visual objects all of those choices that are made in turning them into visual objects and then laying out those visual objects and presenting them to people, those are all persuasive choices. Um, and so you know, in, in that way, we are telling a particular type of story. And so that's what we're trying to do here. Um, now, of course, examples of data visualization start with like the simple, right? Uh, the pie chart, which is uh, the, the first documented style of data visualization uh, from William Playfair. 
Um, it's been around longest in terms of publishing history, um, and everybody knows it. Um, and, you know, it, it, people understand pie charts without any context, right? If you look at these, um, I have no idea what these are about. doesn't matter. Uh, we have enough numerical information, enough color information, and enough shape information for you to form an opinion. Um, if somebody were to ask you leading questions about some of these, um, uh, which of the two pie charts, right? Over here on the right, we have an expanded pie chart. On the left, we have a more traditional pie chart. Um, which of the two is maybe a happier scenario? Which do you think is telling the happier story? Um, most would say the one on the right, um, simply because of the rainbow color palette, right? It's, it's upbeat, it's happy, it's bright. Um, if we were looking at the one on the left, right, a simple question of, so which of these sections uh, do you think is winning? <laughs> Um, I have no context for that statement other than, well, 77% is clearly more, so we'll say that's winning, right? Um, so there's all sorts of predisposed assumptions about visual information um, that we just, we immediately apply to things when we see them, uh, with or without context. Um, of course, you've got your 3D pie charts, right? And then collectively, when you are combining various visualizations to um, give a presentation for something, um, they have to work well together and tell a more cohesive story, right? Uh, everything from the way they're laid out uh, to the color palettes that are chosen. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this is obviously an executive summary for some financial information. <clears throat> and, you know, you can see that uh, we have, I assume this is projected earnings versus actual earnings, uh, versus pending earnings, right? Um, but if I were to present this exact same thing to you, but change the color palette into like tones of reds and oranges, um, you might assume it's bad news, um, simply based on that choice. And of course, uh, data visualization dates way back, uh, much prior to the electronic age, obviously. Um, and its history is um, like most areas of uh, modern design study and practice didn't come into being out of whole cloth. Nobody said, we are going to create data visualization. Instead, there were a variety of historic events and movements that have come together over the years to become what we now know as data visualization. Uh, this is a, a plate uh, from uh, W.E.B. Du Bois' uh, students uh, who created about 63 plates, I believe. Um, for uh, a, a World's Fair in Paris uh, in 1900, uh, telling the story uh, of African Americans uh, in the United States uh, post-slavery uh, in a way that was designed to persuade the rest of the world uh, that the African Americans in America were, were doing much better uh, in a post-slavery world than the propaganda would have you believe at the time. Uh, uh, which is uh, oddly paralleled to things going on in the news today. Um, of course, data visualizations are used for all sorts of other uh, less life-threatening things, uh, such as stations of the moon, uh, various astrological things, uh, evolution, uh, millions of years uh, of evolution in one data visualization. Going through all the various, you know, from bacteria all the way through mammals. This here is a figurative map uh, showing uh, losses of the French army during the uh, during the, the Russian campaign and uh, the War of uh, 1812. There. You know, and then sometimes, particularly with infographics, which is sort of the more modern interpretation of it, um, some data visualizations can lose their elegance, they can lose their nuance, they can be a little heavy-handed, and this is an example of that. Um, a little too much going on in one place, right? We've got the implied map of the United States, you've got a variety of different styles of uh, icons and graphics uh, done in, you know, different illustrative styles. Um, way too much typographic information, um, you know, very dramatic color palette, very stark red, black, and white. So sometimes it's, it's a little overboard. And sometimes they're really beautiful to look at. 
um, using simple shapes, just uh, curves and lines and circles um, and some really simple type, um, you know, to just convey information in the most beautiful way possible, right? Something like this you might not mind hanging on your wall. Um, the subject matter is almost irrelevant. It's just, it's pretty to look at. It's nicely designed. It's balanced really well. Um, I, I do sometimes question the the uh, angle of the baseline of the chart. I don't know why they turned it up at like a 30 degree angle counterclockwise, but other than that, it's really attractive. And that's a subjective opinion, clearly. Um, and of course, one of the more modern popular versions of data visualization uh, is the Venn diagram. It's much like Photoshop has become a verb in, in popular vernacular. The Venn diagram has become a verb all over social media. You know, people say things like, in the Venn diagram of my life, between my love of a peanut butter sandwich and, you know, something like that. Um, but this is what they're talking about when they say the Venn diagram, right? They're just uh, concentric circles that are overlapping each other in certain places. And then that the overlapping, particularly if they are colored in a translucent way, like these are, um, really sort of highlight like the, the, the interrelationship between things. Uh, this is very much like the snake eating its own tail here because we have a Venn diagram about data visualization and this talks about like all the various areas that contributed to you know what we now know as data visualization uh, and i say various areas of design um, but there's obviously a lot of historical elements to it which we'll breeze through in a second um, this here is known as the rose diagram it's it's kind of a combination of a pie chart and a bar chart uh, made famous by florence nightingale uh, which we'll see in a sec but again, just, you know, no real context to this other than just look at the way colors and shapes are used uh, and the way information is presented in the given space. So one thing we don't talk too much about in this class is format. Um, and in design, of course, format refers to the size and the shape of the destination, whether it be a printed page or a website or a mobile application or some other interactive media or whatever. Um, the, the place that it's going to live is known as the format. And so in data visualization, and we're gonna, we didn't pay too much attention to it um, for the logo uh, project, but for this one, we're gonna pay more attention to it in that the information, the visual information that we're gonna put on the page has to fit nicely on the page in a way that helps tell the story, right? Uh, that takes into account things like negative space and margins and whatnot, but we'll get to that. You know, and then some uh, data visualizations, you know, or infographics, uh, you know, they're not as elegant looking, but they're also very conversational. They get the information across in a way that's digestible. It's not too overdone. It's cognitive of the fact that it should have some cohesive visual structure to it. It's not, doesn't look like it's just thrown on the page. And so, you know, I, I, I would hesitate to call this one attractive, but it does a nice job conveying useful information in an easy to understand manner. And there's a lot of value in that for sure. You know, you see that you see these types of data visualizations a lot in places like US News and World Report or Time Magazine or those types of places. Um, and then sometimes even if the the visual elements you are using are simple, like lines and circles and other basic geometric shapes, um, even then it can be a little overdone. So um, simplicity uh, is definitely a place to go with data visualization. And this doesn't mean basic. It just means um, give some breathing room, right? Uh, use your negative space. Uh, give people's eyes a place to rest as they are making their way through the given format, right? Um, think about, you know, a second or third destination for some of the data so that it's not all crammed into one spot. Um, and I realize in real life, there's practical considerations of that. Um, but for our purposes, at least, you know, you can spread things out a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of things I like about this one um, in terms of its design, but it's also pretty crowded and may, probably has way too much information on one presentation. And then, of course, you might be thinking at this point, I have a headache. Um, and, and that can be true with data visualization because it's it's a bit of a puzzle to unwrap in terms of how best to convey information. Um, but based on what we've learned in Illustrator so far, you know, we are going to be using the shape tool and the pen tool and the drawing tools that we've learned so far, as well as all the accompanying palettes and elements um, to be able to create something uh, that conveys the message we want to. Um, so we just have to think about the message a little bit. 
Now, I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but this is, if you're interested in sort of the history of how data visualization came to be, this is the timeline, uh, at least as defined by me, um, and probably some other scholars too. Um, you know, like I said, William Playfair is, is considered one of the first people to use uh, charts and graphs uh, in publishing. At least he was one of the first people that got published, which is not to say he invented these things necessarily. I'm sure other people use them too, but he gets credit for it in 1786 um, because he really pioneered the bar chart, uh, the line graph, and the pie chart, all of which we still use today uh, between 1786 and 1801. Um, and uh, we won't go through all these, but just to give you a quick view of him, that's him. Uh, born in Scotland, uh, was a engineer and political economist. Um, and so a lot of the history of this you'll find is of mathematicians and economists and, and, and other um, non-design or art type people. Um, but since we are dealing with data, this is where it starts. And uh, that's his first bar graph. And there's a few things moved around in terms of how we normally see these. Like normally the, uh, the row designations are now on the left hand side and the uh, column designations are on the bottom usually. Um, but other than that, it pretty much looks like any bar graph you've ever seen, right? Uh, so it hasn't um, changed a whole lot. Uh, flow chart or line graph. Uh, and then his first pie chart, which you can you can see by the paper that it's on is, you know, yellow legal pad. Um, just using some uh, some letter templates, you know, uh, early drafting tools uh, were used often in early data visualization. So anyway, back to the overview. Um, then the next real notable uh, historical event in data visualization was Florence Nightingale's Rose Diagram um, in 1858. Um, many people know who Florence Nightingale is uh, for her contribution to the world of medicine, um, but she's lesser known for her contribution to the world of data visualization. Uh, in pursuit of understanding medicine better. So, um, you know, when, when she and her team were sent out to uh, the Crimean War front where uh, soldiers were dying left and right after they were injured and brought back to the field hospitals and the military uh, at the time could not figure out why everybody was dying in these military hospitals. Um, she went out there and figured out that it was uh, sanitary conditions, um, which is... is, is interesting by today's standards because you know you think of hospitals of any kind as being like some of the cleanest places at least that's the ideal right um but uh was not the case back then they didn't understand a lot of things about infection and whatnot so anyway she wrote up a uh a very large report um uh, on this uh to present uh to the heads of government and military and she, she knew two things uh she she knew that uh, it probably wouldn't get read uh because uh, A, it was very long and, and they were fighting a war and B, she was a woman in 1858. Um, and so, you know, the respect for her abilities only went so far. Um, and so she included uh, a really nice page uh, in her report of a couple of rose diagrams that basically showed that the number of the mortality rate, the number of deaths drastically went down from uh, before she instituted uh, cleanliness standards to after she instituted cleanliness standards. Um, and then her goal was that if that would get their interest, uh, that they would then read the rest of the report. Um, and it worked. Uh, 1900, I already talked a little bit about W.E.B. Du Bois uh, at the exposition at the, uh, at the World's Fair in Paris. Um, I'll zip down here a little bit. See, there's Florence. And there's that page with the two rose diagrams. Uh, they're interestingly arranged in that the way we would think today about this is that we'd probably put the earlier one on the left, you know, the one from April 1854 to March 1855 on the left, and then the later one showing the improvement in mortality rate on the right because we normally read left to right, top to bottom. Um, but that's not how she arranged it. Um, but it's still easy to understand, right? Some basic typography of the time. Uh, the rose diagrams are not hard to understand, right? It's all just sort of chronological by month. 
uh, cooking around in a clockwise ma fashion. Um, and then, you know, a couple of paragraphs of information. Uh, and if you can understand this, well, then you get the point. Uh, there's WEB. And that is a photo of the exposition that he contributed to. Um, now, him and his students didn't do the entire thing. Um, but they contributed all of the plates of the data visualizations, which you can see down here. Uh, the exposition was also filled with books of poetry and photo albums and literature and a variety of other things um, of African-American culture um, that was of interest to people. But the, their, their hope was that at minimum people would flip through the data visualizations and glean some insight into the reality of the situation. Um, and then, uh, after we get past these three very important people, um, we really move into sort of like design movements or art movements, as it were. So Russian constructivism, uh, Italian futurism, uh, and de style, uh, all roughly happening at the same time at the beginning of the 1900s, uh, first and second decade of the 1900s. Um, all contributed to the visual vocabulary of modern data visualization, um, which is not to say that the Russian constructivists or the Italian futurists in their really nice hats and clothes and the de stylists, which I'm not even sure that's a word, I just made that up, uh, in their very limited color palette, um, the, any of them were even thinking about data visualization. I'm pretty sure they weren't. Um, but modern data visualization has drawn influence from the use of geometric shapes and thick lines and simple, simple color palettes uh, that are germane to these things. Um, and I'm not going to go through the images on these. Uh, you're probably familiar with some of these movements. And if not, go look them up. They're interesting. Um, I'm a big fan of Italian futurism because they just like putting blimps in a lot of their paintings. Um, and there is a direct link between Italian futurism and the Jetsons. Uh, prove me wrong. Uh, and then moving on after that, uh, after these three styles, uh, again, kind of in the same time period, a little later on, uh, just at the beginning of the 1920s or 1919, we have the founding of the Bauhaus, uh, which uh, you may have heard of, the German Art and Design School, uh, which uh, took the radical idea of combining arts and crafts uh, into one place. And the simplistic explanation of it is that if you are familiar with uh, any sort of um, vocational education uh, in the United States or Canada or anywhere, um, where students spend like the first year trying out various types of uh, shops or artistic endeavors or skills or crafts or whatever, um, and getting a little bit of education in, in a variety of areas, and then in their second year, sort of focusing on a specific area, that's basically the model of the Bauhaus. And yes, I'm way oversimplifying it. Um, because prior to that, um, that's not really you know, how it worked. Uh, uh, people would uh, work with experts, you know, with masters, as it were, in certain areas, whether you wanted to be a carpenter or a sculptor or a painter, and you would work under somebody until, you know, as an apprentice, until you yourself could then go on and start your own practice, and then maybe you would take an apprentice at some point. Um, but the idea of a, a large-scale school where uh, all students would come in and study a little bit of architecture and a little bit of drawing and a little bit of painting and, you know, all these things. I mean, get a more rounded arts and crafts education uh, really came out of the Bauhaus. Um, but the other thing that came out of the Bauhaus, of course, are certain design styles, um, uh, including typographic styles that were also uh, used as sort of the foundation uh, of what a lot of what we see in data visualization. Uh, and then these two together, uh, and yeah, they're 25 years apart from each other, but they really go hand in hand, is the isotype picture language and the international typographic style, also known as the Swiss style of typography. Um, those two visual representations uh, really play a big role in what we now think of in terms of icons and pictograms and pictographs and modern looking simplistic typography. Um, uh, and again, I'm not going to run through the images here, but uh, certainly check them out. Uh, we can 
talk more about them in class too. Uh, and then once we get through those artistic styles and those major movements here, uh, we land on some people again, uh, some specific people. And yes, I know there were people involved in the other things too, but I'm, I'm going through this quick. Um, uh, John Wilder Tukey uh, was a professor uh, of uh, statistics, uh, and uh, he is or was credited as being sort of like the modern father of data visualization. Um, and his student, uh, his graduate student, uh, was Edward Tufte. And they were really sort of building the vocabulary of what became known as modern data visualization. The interesting thing is that Tufty wasn't interested in data visualization that much. I'll scroll down to him really quickly. Um, he was, oh look, Russian constructivism. Oh look, Italian futurism. Um, de style. He was, oh, that's my other handout. <laughs> that's the other part. Anyway, moving on. Um, Tufty wasn't super interested in data visualization. He wanted to be, you know, more of a mathematician uh, or a statistician. Um, but a bunch of reporters, uh, I forget which newspaper, it'll come to me, um, came to the university uh, where he was student teaching uh, in his graduate work and uh, wanted to learn more about this data visualization thing that Tukey was working on. And Tukey was like, listen, I'm too busy for this. Uh, you, student Tufty, could you put together a, you know, a one-day workshop presentation for these reporters to just teach them about data visualization um, and then send them on their way. And so Tufty said, sure, reluctantly, and put it together and presented it to the reporters. And they loved it and went back to their newspaper and wrote all about it. Um, and then Tufty essentially, uh, this sparked interest in this, this newfound area of study of data visualization. And then Tufty, of course, uh, became the face of it. Um, and you know, he is credited today as being sort of like the father of modern data visualization, um, in part because of the way the story went down and it was published and, and the, the larger public uh, became aware of it, um, but also in part because he's still alive, um, which I know sounds terrible, but if Tukey was still alive, we'd be talking about him more. Um, but to this day, Tufty still goes around and he served in the Obama administration, uh, working on transparency in terms of presenting data uh, in a variety of projects that the Obama administration did. Um, he's been going around giving talks for years. Um, he's, 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 a, he's, he's really amazing at it. And for a guy who, who didn't really want to get into data visualization at first, he's really been a good uh, diplomat for it, as it were. So anyway, that is the overview of all that. Yes, we can get more into that, but we don't have time for all that. Um, but we can talk more on Tuesday, if you would like. So back to our assignment then. So now that you've got a little bit of that behind you, start thinking about what do you want to present visually? What are your data topics? What is your headline going to be? Um, these are just examples. If you happen to be in love with one of these, you are welcome to take it. It's fine with me. Uh, don't just take it because it's right there and it's easy. Maybe you happen to love one of these subjects. But if not, go do some research. Uh, go get yourself some data-based fun facts that you can uh, visually represent using Illustrator, okay? So on Tuesday, when we meet again, I'm going to ask everybody, uh, what their uh, data topic is going to be. So be prepared, okay? All right. Uh, thank you for tuning in, and I will see you in person on Tuesday.